The information provided in the interviews and on the website of the Autism, ADHD, and Sensory Processing Disorder Summer is for information and educational purposes only. It is not intended to diagnose or treat your child and is not a substitute for working with a qualified practitioner. There are many gifted, passionate, and knowledgeable practitioners with hundreds of hours, if not thousands of hours of clinical experience. Part of our goal is to give you the knowledge and tools you need to effectively advocate for your child. No one knows your child better than you. No one knows your child's history and can better judge what's normal and abnormal for your child. The greatest success in recovery comes with the parent being informed and asking the right questions and making the best decisions for their child in coordination with a team of qualified practitioners in different areas of specialty. Enjoy the summit. Hi, I want to welcome back to the Autism, ADHD, and Sensory Processing Disorder Summit, Alex Doman. I want to tell you a little bit about Alex. Alex is the founder and CEO of Advanced Brain Technologies, the co-founder of Sleep Genius, and the founder of the, and director of the Movement Program. And he's a best-selling co-author of Healing at the Speed of Sound. He's part of a third generation in, in a family of pioneers in the field of child and human brain development. Alex has focused his career on sound, music, digital health and technology, and their capacity to improve the brain and health performance. His production credits include co-producer of the Music for the Healing at, at the Speed of Sound, Music for Babies, and In Time, executive creator, producer, creator, and collaborator on numerous other projects, products, and technologies, including the listing program, Brain Builder, Sound Health, Music for Mind, Waves, Multisensory Audio System, and TLP Online, as well as TAVs, or Test of Auditory and Visual Skills, and the NASA-based sleep technology, Sleep Genius. Alex has been interviewed for, in many organizations, including uh, NBC, CBS, ABC, and MSNBC, and many others. Uh, and he has written for publications and journals, including Sound and Listening in Healthcare and Therapy, Autism Research, Research and Treatment, Autism Science Digest, SI Focus Magazine, Autism Asperger's Digest, and the Cutting Edge Therapies for Autism. He's also the host of the Listening Program Radio and Podcast, with guests including David Pullmutter, Daniel Siegel, Michael Mer and now I'm going to say the name now from Merzenic, and uh, many other thought leaders in this area. He, he continues to lecture internationally and has trained thousands of allied health and uh, sorry, allied health education and music professionals in brain-based applications of sound and music and serves as an advisor to Senoson, uh, mm -hmm. Neuropop, Aurora Schools, Autism Brainstorm, and is a member of the Board of Directors of Autism Hope Alliance. That is quite a list of achievements. So Alex, I'm really excited that you're here today. We're gonna to be talking about leveraging uh, your child's neuroplasticity through music, rhythm, movement, and neurotech. But before we get into all that, can you tell me, I mean, obviously you come from a long line of people in your family that have worked in this area, but tell us a little bit more about that for, for people who don't know your work. Yeah, um, Tara, first of all, it's great to be here. I'm really happy to, to be back and, and join you for the summit. Um, you know, I've been very privileged um, to come from a family that's been in the field of human brain development and performance now for about 75 years. Um, so uh, a long time, I'm third generation and we're raising the fourth. And, um, you know, the family work started based on a very strong belief that every human has unlimited potential. And our family's mission has really been about doing everything we can within our power to research and develop methods, programs, technologies to help harness this amazing potential of the human brain. And started with my grandfather, who was a physiatrist, which is a doctor of physical medicine and rehabilitation. Uh, and his brother, who was a physical therapist, uh, working with neurologists and anthropologists and psychologists and just an amazing team um, that started this work back when the world thought the brain was um, fixed, that it was hardwired, that it couldn't change. And these were the pioneers that said, no, the brain's softwired it can change and what we need to do is find ways to stimulate it and make that change happen. 
So, you know, that was the first generation. And then the work grew uh, with my father, uh, Robert Doman Jr., in the National Association for Child Development, his sister Ellen, uh, their cousins, and the other families work and has uh, gone on to myself and my brother and other family members and continues to grow. Uh, it, it is what I find so astounding about that exactly what you're talking about is that they were your family's been busy working in this area before anyone um, even before most people really grasp the idea that the brain is plastic and actually the opposite of that it was the dogma was is that our brains were hardwired and that's why it's so amazing um that they that you've all persevered through years of of going against the grain um because you knew it was right and uh i mean i can't even imagine how many uh families have been helped because of that so um i thank you and all all of your family members in the past and yes the next generation which is always the fun part uh, to see where they're there they will end up um, so it's actually it's the perfect uh, segue into our topic today which is based uh, you know all your work is based in the idea that there's um, plasticity and and you and I were just talking about positive plasticity yeah. so can you walk everybody through what neuroplasticity is and what the difference is between positive and negative plasticity yeah it, you know it it's interesting I think you know 20 years ago um, brain plasticity was starting to come into the vernacular and it's become kind of a popular idea. We see it in the popular press, we see it in the science press and in the media, um, but sometimes we forget not everyone may know what that means. So uh, I think the way to, to think about it is that our plasticity is the brain's ability to change itself. The brain is malleable, it's changeable, and it adapts to the environment that it's in, that we're in. And that adaptation can be positive or negative. And let, let's just take an example. And this was um, you know, something important to think about. Let's take our brand new beautiful uh, infant girl, just born and comes into the world. And her brain is open, receptive, ready to take in everything in her environment and based on what she's exposed to is going to predict and impact her opportunities in the future. Now let's take this beautiful, young, vibrant little baby and put her in a dark room uh, with no sound, with no light, with no touch, with no love. Uh, what do you think would happen? Well, I, I mean, I, I can't even imagine. <laughs> it would be tra it would be traumatic, and uh, you know, there's no sensory input, so we're not we're not going to get the development we need. Right. So if we're in a in a environment which is sensory deprived, um, that brain will lack sufficient input to grow and to develop, mm -hmm. and for that beautiful baby to grow and speak, um, emote, connect, learn and contribute to society. And that's an example of what can happen to people when they're put in difficult circumstances, uh, such as, you know, back when orphanages were dark, scary places and mm -hmm. institutions uh, had a lot of sensory deprivation in them and negative plasticity would occur. So rather than positive developmental plasticity, the brain would atrophy and areas would begin to die rather than to flourish and to grow. So let's talk about the opposite because as the loving parents that are um, watching this interview now and professionals that are all here in the belief of our children and what they can do, we do everything that we can to promote positive plasticity and developmental plasticity. So let's start with the developmental, plasti developmental plasticity, which is what lays the foundation for life, okay? So we start by organizing the brain in the lower brain areas, um, those areas that are the autonomic functions that begin in the brain stem. Then we go to the pons in the midbrain and up to the cortex. So there's a developmental progression that happens in childhood. The foundation is like laid initially in movement. We're gonna talk about that a bit later, mm -hmm. I believe, which supports the higher level functions. Now the activities and the experiences that the child has is going to inform 
what they're able to do and what they're able to experience. So we start with the sensory environment. What kind of touch is the child receiving? Well, that's going to inform our touch sense, okay, our tactility and how we feel light pressure and deep pressure, and that's going to inform how we actually move later. Um, what are we smelling? What are we tasting? What are we seeing? What are we hearing? Now, we may think the more stimulation, the better. That's not necessarily so. We don't wanna you know, take our kid and drop them in the middle of a nightclub because there's a lot of movement and lights and sound going on. That's gonna be disorganizing to that brain. What we wanna do is introduce developmentally appropriate sensory input in a positive environment that is structured as the brain is designed to grow and to develop. And that's actually a lot of what my family focused on, which we'll touch on, or what are the right developmental milestones, mm -hmm. uh, what needs to be done to help support those, um, you know, what are essential to that growth. So the brain is malleable, it's soft, it's pliable, and it changes and adapts in response to our environment. When we learn, the brain is changing. So each new learning, the brain is changing its shape. The brain that you wake up with tomorrow is gonna to be influenced by what you do today. So it's a constant and dynamic process. Yeah, I think what's so interesting about that is, um, I know you're gonna get into some of the milestones and talking about that is that uh, you often hear parents talking about um, either milestones that are missed um, or they think they've skipped them which makes them more advanced. And uh, I, I'm hoping we can touch on what that means as well, because um, understanding that developmental process and that positive plasticity and how it builds on one after another, I think is really key to understanding maybe where the missteps happened earlier in development. Well, let, let's, let's touch on that. So we need to go back a few decades. And uh, as my grandfather and their team were researching ways to rehabilitate people with brain damage, organic brain injury, traumatic brain injury, how do we take broken brains and make them function well again? And as they develop, develop techniques, and the first techniques were movement-based therapies, uh, developmental movement, creeping and crawling, and other activities that were designed to help organize the brain to support higher level functions, they began to do some research and they designed what I refer to as the first functional brain map. So before you had brain imaging, what you had was the power of observation to watch a human's movement, to listen to their speech, to see their actions, their output to understand what was happening inside of that brain and how it was responding to the input that it had. So they studied primitive people around the world to see how the environment that they were raised in influenced their, their language, their communication, and their motor development and their social development uh, as, as a people. And as they did this research, they identified key developmental milestones that were essential for a brain to become what we call neurologically organized and efficient. So again, going from the brain stem to the pons to the midbrain up to the cortex, they identified seven areas of essential development uh, through the sensory input channels and the motor output channels that would make somebody neurologically whole. And when they evaluated children or adults that had injuries or developmental delays or learning difficulties, through the observation techniques they developed, they could identify areas in the brain that weren't fully developed, and then would develop exercises or specific treatment regimes that would be carried out to reorganize that area of the brain that maybe missed a developmental stage or had an injury. Either way, the same thing was addressed. So we have to think about building a home, okay? We first think about the foundation, but we have to go below that. What's the earth that the home is being built on? Is it stable? And then we need a strong foundation. We need to frame the house and then build the higher levels on top of that foundation. But if the ground's unstable and the foundation we put upon that ground is also unstable, 
then the house can collapse. And we can think about the brain very much in the same way. And the collapse could be a learning difficulty, a communication challenge, a behavioral um, issue with a child. So we need a strong base and foundation in the lower brain areas to support the higher levels of brain performance. Um, that's, uh, it, it's, it's amazing how, um, when, when we do start to break those things down though, that you can start to see where the challenges come from because obviously someone who's skilled at, at doing that will understand which parts of the brain have been impacted by that developmental milestone being missed or some some of the foundation or other things uh, not being there. Uh, so with that in mind, because a lot of the parents that are listening, they have children that have a number of things that have gone wrong, uh, but many of them it's sensory overload. Mm -hmm. um, they're not processing sensory information appropriately. What types of interventions, I know that you, you've talked about, um, th th there are some obviously involving movement, but there's, there, there are several different ways that we can go and retrain the brain and use the power of po positive plasticity. So maybe if you can talk about um, some of those different methods to re do the retraining, uh, people understand how this can help. So, you know, as we get into that, I'm really glad you brought this up, Tara, is that our Sensory modulation, our ability to modulate or respond to sensory input. Um, you can kind of put in three very basic categories at a high level. We're processing sensory input efficiently, uh, the way that we should to get the most learning from it and ability to respond to our environment. Or we have a hypo response, responsivity, meaning a low response to the input or a hyper response. And what we're trying to do is get that just right amount. Mm -hmm. And the way in which the brain learns to get that right amount is through sensory experience. So what you do is you actually stimulate the senses. You engage the senses in very specific ways in order to train the brain to respond appropriately. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the children um, that we work with and parents um, on, on this program that are watching will have children that are, say, sound sensitive. Certain sounds in the environment cause them to shut down or to melt down uh, or to become aggressive, to have a change in their behavior because they're having a maladaptive response to what's happening around them. The brain can't make sense of the stimulation. And this can be true of all of us. We all have a threshold, right? So you You've got, we have an occupational therapist uh, who's a professor of occupational therapy who I really respect that talks about this sensory cup. And you can only put so much in the cup before it overflows. And we all have different size cups. And that cup size is influenced by overall how we're feeling, how much sleep we're getting, how well we're eating, um, what's going on in our life. So sometimes our cups overflow really quickly and other times we've got a lot of capacity uh, within them. But at some point, we all have a threshold where we get overwhelmed and the brain can't process what's coming in. So what we need to do is change, train the brain to regulate itself automatically, to filter out what's extraneous and unneeded, and to focus attention on what is needed. So different therapies are used for that. So if we have touch sensitivities, there are sequences of touch stimulation exercises that can be done to then desensitize the system and allow us to not be overly sensitive, say to light touch. Or if we have kids, for example, um, that are covered in bruises and bumps and are crashers and or have really low muscle tone, right? And they don't feel deep sensation. Well, then we have to provide deep sensation to stimulate the brain to understand what that feels like to normalize it. Same with sight, same with sound. So what we focus on is sound. Mm -hmm. And using music, uh, therapeutic music, that's very specifically designed to help the brain regulate sensory input so that it's no longer overwhelmed. And it's done by presenting very pleasant sounds uh, of different sound frequencies in a very specific order through a prescribed regime that gradually helps the brain better process the sound, then come to understand it and benefit from it. 
Yeah. So when we talk about that, so you, you've listed out a number of things that um, are directly related to certain senses, but with the music therapy though, can't, do you see other sensory challenges or other behavioral challenges resolve? Because it is impacting more than just the processing of sound, correct? Well, it, you know, this is really important to talk about because our brains are wired for sound, first of all. Mm -hmm. Okay. The first sense to fully develop in utero is our sense of hearing and movement. So this is important. Movement and hearing start in the ear. Movement in the vestibular system, hearing in the cochlear system. So these are systems that are directly interconnected and the first organs, sensory organs to develop. So that tells us something about their importance in the hierarchy of our brain's development, right? Because the, the form and tells us about the function of a system. So this foundation of how we're processing sound is very key. And we have to understand that our senses are not isolated. They're interrelated. So different brain areas are directly connected to other brain areas. And then they have other regions in the brain that they connect in farther regions. So what we hear influences how we understand language, which influences how we express language and influences our motor control area and our other sensory areas in the brain. The eyes and the ears have a very close relationship with one another, as does touch and tactility. Mm -hmm. So our senses are interconnected and sound is one modality that has a global influence over these because sound and music in particular has more global influence on the brain than any known stimulus. So think of sound as something we're wired for and music is the best means in which to provide great input. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's interesting to um, parents probably that you start to hear things in terms of what you're saying and start to relate to your children because uh, vestibular processing is is and, and and challenges like the kids that have bruises on them everywhere because they have imbalance and proprioception issues. It it all starts to make a lot of sense when you start breaking it down that way from uh, the basics of developmental and and like you said right from in utero. So if we're using music therapy, um, maybe you can talk about your tool because obviously you developed it for a reason the way the way it's set up. Um, how that looks and um, what types of resolution of, of symptoms do parents often see when they use that type of, in particular, your program? So, you know, first of all, what we'll reference is that this is what we'll say neuroscience-based music listening therapy. Quite different from music therapy, which has a, a music therapist that's working with live music and techniques one-on-one -on -one with an individual. What we're doing with music listening therapy and two programs, the listening program, which is based in classical music, mm -hmm. and in time, which is in rhythm-based world music, is that we have created specially arranged or composed music that is recorded in high definition sound, which is the highest sound quality, to enhance the natural attributes within the music. And these attributes are frequency, uh, amplitude or volume, um, timing for temporal processing, and space, spatial processing and awareness. So all music has those four components. So what we're doing is recording the music, having the musicians express the music in particular ways, and then in post-production, acoustically modify the music to enhance aspects that call them out to the brain, to help then influence different brain regions to better process them. So the foundation is in what we call our auditory map. So we have what's called an auditory tonotopic map, which is a map for frequency in the brain. That frequency map starts in the ear where we have hair cells in the inner ear that match the range of sound frequencies that we can hear, ranging from very low tones to very high tones, 20 to 20,000 hertz. So we have groups of cells in the cochlea programmed to these frequencies. Mm -hmm. So what happens is when those cells receive those frequencies, they get excited and they fire. 
and then they send a signal which goes through all the levels of the brain up to the cortex to what's called our auditory cortex, which lays right in here on each side of our brain. There are neurons in the auditory cortex that are also frequency mapped. So those neurons respond when these cells fire here. So that is the auditory tonotopic response. So when we stimulate these cells in specific ways over time, they become more efficient. And the timing mechanisms in the system become more efficient. And then they learn to better process sound so that we can use it. So the listening program and in time have music that's mapped to the frequencies so that we gradually stimulate the entire frequency map with different dynamics in order to activate that system. Now within that, we're also working with time, the temporal aspects of the music. Music is made up of timing and synchrony, uh, as is the brain, which is programmed to it. So we're matching those timing mechanisms to teach fast and slow and the rate of phonemic speech and the speech and language frequencies so that we can process language. Um, motor development. So we're in different frequencies and we should um, step back and say the low frequencies influence the body more. The mid-range of frequencies influence speech and communication and the high level frequencies influence higher cognitive function. So there is a frequency map to human performance that the programs are designed to match. We have amplitude changes, which um, change the volume at different levels as you're listening, which help us recognize uh, rapid change, especially in speech, so that we can recognize speech sounds for speech processing and speech output. And then the music is uh, recorded in a way that we uh, do a surround sound technique in headphones that allow the listener to understand where their body is in relation to the physical space around them. Mm -hmm. So that we're stimulating an awareness of the environment through the way the music is processed. So a typical uh, listening session uh, with a listening program will be 15 minutes, uh, within time, nine minutes. You go through a progression of what we call an ABC design, where we gradually introduce the different techniques of sound in the music at a slower tempo, the music gradually increases in tempo, so timing, right? The speed changes the pace of the music or the beats per minute. So it goes from slower to faster, back to slower over that duration. The complexity of the sound, how much you're hearing, how many instruments, um, going from a simple arrangement to a more complex arrangement back to simple. The amplitude changes go from not very complex to very dynamic back to not very complex. And then the spatial challenge of how we're processing the sound around us, what we may be doing between left, right brain organization for bilateral integration or greater spatial awareness. So in each session, we provide the just right amount of challenge to the brain so that it's learning and adapting and having a neuroplastic response, but not so much that we overstimulate the listener and they shut down but there has to be enough in order to get a change to. So it's about that just right amount, having a pleasant experience. So nine or 15 minutes, once or twice a day, five days a week, over the course of time, progressing through the different sound frequencies is a developmental approach, thinking about how the brain is organized and learns to help it become more efficient through this listening process. And it's done through specialized headphones uh, happen to have a pair here mm -hmm. so you will listen through headphones that have a what's called a bum conductor mm -hmm. or a vibrational component so that the body is getting the stimulus of the music while the ears are also getting the auditory input this helps ground us to lower stress levels and create a very receptive environment uh, and to help regulate uh, autonomic nervous system functions while we're focused on what's happening with the music. Yeah. So um, that's, that's a very kind of high level uh, explanation. And of course, there's, there's a lot more to it. Yeah, um, well, but that... at a basic level, it's uh, specifically designed therapeutic music that's listened to according to a protocol that is developmentally appropriate for each individual.
Yeah. And yeah, what I like about um, that is, is it is that little bit of increments over time, because we know that the big change it's, you've got to get that, that arc in there of, of just the incremental changes and, and perfecting that is really tough uh, to know how much you can advance them for how long. So it's, it's, I, and I know you guys have spent many, many years figuring that out and uh, perfecting it. One of the, um, and the other thing I actually just want to mention, because you did mention that the headphones at the end, in terms of it triggering the uh, autonomic nervous system and putting them in a, a we talked about this last year, but just um, putting them in a, par a parasympathetic state. Um, if you could just talk about a little bit about the importance of that too, because it is one of these things that we, um, as parents, we know we've got this issue with our children. They are chronically in a sympathetic state, most of the kids. And um, it is really hard to find tools to put them in that uh, rest and digest state so they can, they actually, their brains can repair, but also so their bodies can repair as well. So if you can just touch on that a little bit, I think it's still yeah. important to talk about it again. So the, the autonomic nervous system, which is the automatic nervous system, right, has the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. The sympathetic you can think of is the accelerator and the parasympathetic is the brake. And these are necessary for survival, right? We have to be able to respond to a threat uh, when it occurs. And what happens with a lot of our kids with sensory challenges is that they have a false perception, okay? The senses have a false perception of being unsafe, okay? We're, we're safe, but the inputs we're giving us, we feel unsafe. And our sensory sensitive kids are often in this state because there's too much light, there's too much sound, there's too much movement, there's too much activity, I'm not safe. So they get in this either very high arousal, anxious, frenetic, I don't know what to do, or they actually shut down in response to it as a form of protection. So, if we are in what we'll call survival mode, okay, so we're heavily in the sympathetic nervous system, we are focusing all of our attention on dealing with this unsafe environment or perceived unsafe environment. Therefore, we cannot attend, we cannot learn, we cannot engage and interact because our attention is being diverted to survival. So what a large part of our work is about is helping that individual get out of that state. One of the best ways to do that is with music, something that's very pleasant and very enjoyable and can directly impact this autonomic nervous system. Uh, some, and something we haven't talked about is the, the vagal nerve mm -hmm. and its relationship to the auditory system and the fact that when we put on these headphones, especially with the bone conductor, we get vagal nerve stimulation. And, that vagal nerve has a very direct influence on our autonomic nervous system. And we can help calm that system through the music and the vibration. And over time, through that training, the brain learns how to be relaxed, how to go put the brake on, go into that parasympathetic state. So for example, a lot of kids, when they're going in for therapy sessions, uh, our occupational therapists that are providers or our speech therapists um, may do a session of the listening to get the child ready as a primer so their system can relax and they can be at ease and be ready to work. Brain injured kids um, that we've worked with that are hyper rigid, okay, their bodies just can't relax because they're in that state we put on the headphones and they become available, they become accessible. So that regulation is about accessibility, it's about attention, it's about a ready state to learn and to grow and to have a natural adaptive response to our environment. But we also don't want to just live in a parasympathetic state where we can't react to a stressor or a threat in our environment. So it's about maintaining homeostasis, yeah. finding that balance, that just right um, self-regulation. Uh, that we need to perform. Yeah, I, I love the fact that you brought up the issue around in terms of uh, vagal stimulation because that is something we do talk about um, throughout the summit. 
because again, it is one of those challenges of how do we get that vagal nerve uh, stimulation because most of the interventions are really challenging for kids in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, we were, you know, using the gag reflex is not really something we want to try uh, with the kids. It's often one that, that's suggested because it works, but um, there's very few tools out there that we can use that can do this. So I, I'm really glad we touched on that as well. Before, when you were talking about the In Time program, it's one that uses both music, but in, in terms of with rhythm, and actually it incorporates a little bit of movement as well. Can you just touch on how that works and where that sort of falls in, in the, um, you know, where you see it in the therapeutic uh, process? Yeah, so music listening therapy as a, as a field, our work and others has been centered around kind of what we know about the structure of classical music and um, listening program advanced brain technologies this is the 19th year of the listening program and 20th year of our company and we work with thousands of practitioners we've trained worldwide in all therapeutic disciplines and they were asking for us to do something that had a strong rhythm and timing element to it because while the listening program addresses some of that it doesn't do it as directly as something that is based in drumming and more primal foundational rhythms. So In Time uses original compositions of world music that are based primarily in percussion-based music that has been composed and played according to our uh, low, mid, and high frequency spectrum, uh, different tempos, different meters, um, and combinations of, of meters, polymeters, uh, which are important um, timing, synchrony influencers. So what in time does is in nine minute sessions through that ABC modular design, takes increasingly complex rhythms with changes in tempo and timing using drumming that you first of all listen to for nine minutes. Then after that nine minutes is over, and you'll notice that in time is shorter than the listening program. Listening program is a 15 minute session, in time, nine minutes. We get there faster with the rhythm based music, and it's also more demanding because it is more primal. So we initially did 15 minute sessions and they were too much with the rhythm based music. So at the end of the nine minutes, we then move into what we call an integration phase for three minutes. We either just sit and rest with the music off or whatever natural movement occurs in activity we want to engage in, we transition to is an integration period. After that two or three minute integration period, we move to what we call body percussion. So we begin to take the rhythms we've been listening to and we do different movement sequences on the body. It could be clapping, it could be feet stomping, different sequences based on the developmental level of the individual, starting from simple to more complex sequences. And after we do that body percussion, we move to the in time drum, which is a drum which we developed with Dr. Remo Belly at Remo as a therapeutic drum that is designed to be played with the hands or with a mallet with just that listener or with a therapist or parent. And we then begin to introduce that object extension with drumming uh, for three minutes or however long. So we move from passive listening to an active integration phase with that movement. And we've seen some incredibly you know, exciting things with this, very similar to the listening program. Um, reduce sensory sensitivities, improved learning, better communication, um, better movement, emotional regulation, um, better affect, increased mood. But then we see areas where more specifically synchrony, rhythm, timing uh, within time has been very exciting. But we saw something with it that we didn't expect, which was interesting in the clinical trial. So in our internal clinical trials, before the program was released, we had, um, it was close to about 100 subjects, adults and children do the program. And in the adults, we had this uncanny 
uh, report of mood change in adults that suffered from depression and anxiety. So they had depression and anxiety, and the more they did in time, the fewer symptoms they had and their better overall mood and arousal um, and self-regulation. So that, that was very exciting to see. Um, but it's very foundational. It's very primal. So um, as our providers or parents are thinking about what program to work with, um, same populations are using it, but if we have more rhythm, motor, timing, synchrony issues, we'll likely move toward in time. And then in addition to just the percussion-based music, and by percussion, I mean there's over 100 instruments used in the production of in time. So you have membranous drums, you have clay pots, you have metals and wood instruments and a whole array that our composer and musician Nacho Armani is a master with. But then in addition to the percussion based, we have what we call combined modules, where then we have this melodic influence um, you know, with piano, even though a piano is a percussive instrument, we use it as melodic influence. Charango, guitar, harp. So you get these beautiful melodic structures with the foundational rhythms, which allow us to work on the foundation with the rhythm, and then this separation of melodic processing as well. So that works on very different levels. So it, it's a really exciting program. Yeah, and I've listened to uh, some of the music in that program, and it is actually really engaging music. It's yeah. um, I, I encourage parents to check it out because it's, it's not what, when you talk about percussive um, uh, music, it's not necessarily what you think. You may, I'm sure a lot of parents are wondering, wondering whether their children would tolerate it, but uh, it's, it's incredibly engaging, beautiful music. So um, we'll have to make sure we get the links in there so they can go over to listen to the sample music. Um, so obviously that, so that's a, a, a program that in, it includes both music and movement. You've also developed a movement training program specifically um, that doesn't incorporate music. Can you, uh, so, in, and I know from my work as well, um, how important movement is in terms of um, stimulating positive plasticity. So can you tell us what that program and why that you found it was important to develop that one um, separate from the, the, the music and listening therapy? Yeah. So if, you know, if we step back, um, my family's work started movement-based therapies mm -hmm. um, because first we become physically efficient, right? Mm -hmm. And we, you know, we crawl on our belly, we creep on our hands or knees, then we move to an upright position. When we move to that upright position, language begins to develop. And as we get higher language skills, our cognitive abilities become more complex and we become thinking individuals, right? Responding to our environment appropriately. So movement is the foundation because it organizes the lower brain centers. And in order for us to pay attention, to communicate and to learn, we have to move with automaticity without thinking about it, um, as opposed to moving cortically with thought. So often if we see a brain injured child and they're having to think about every action as they do it um, versus moving automatically as we should, all of their energy and attention is devoted to the thought of movement. Okay, so it's very foundational. So why did the movement come, uh, program come to be? Well, it's important to really think about our brains have many clots and we are very time and synchrony dependent as human beings. And just as an example, there are many rhythms in our life and there's a whole biological field called chronobiology and chrono coming from chronos of time in the Greek that is studying the rhythms in life and how they influence us. And I think what we're probably most familiar with is the circadian rhythm. Okay, that 24-hour body clock with our sleep-wake cycles. When it's light, we wake. When it's dark, we go to sleep. And that sets a structure of our rhythms. 
but we have different rhythms in our life and very micro rhythms within our brain clocks, um, such as our temporal resolution, okay? The, the clock in the brain that has oscillations and clocks that are responsible for neural efficiency. We have the brain network and communication of synchronization that's organizing different associated areas in the brain that support our attentional control system. So as we step back, we need to move with automaticity so that we can attend, learn, and think at higher levels. And there's a lot of research around the fact that now um, movement is being used as a predictor of learning and actually as a diagnostic tool for kids with learning issues. Well, that's what my family said for a very long time. Uh, and now the, the research is um, upholding that. Um, but the movement program was actually a happy accident. So we'll just give a little story. Uh, we'll keep it brief. The learning uh, movement program came about through research uh, outside of London uh, that started in the early 2000s. And a teacher who had brought the listening program into a school to help kids with reading issues also wanted to introduce a set of developmental movement exercises. And the school ended up doing years of research, which became a longitudinal study. And this was done at what's called the Lee Academy in Dartford. And they ended up studying hundreds of kids. And they had different groups. They had a movement group, a listening group, combined listening and movement simultaneously, listening first, then movement, and vice versa. And what was very interesting through the movements uh, is that they were working with kids with reading problems and typical kids. And what was found with the movement program, which is a set of developmentally appropriate exercises, there are about 11 exercises that are done with a specific timing to them, frequency, intensity, and duration for brain plasticity. Uh, each day, the children would do a 15 to 20 minute session, and that 15 to 20 minute session would go through a progression of movements, and each day the movements become more complex as the more foundational movements were mastered. And over the course of that five days a week for 12 weeks, very significant outcomes in um, primitive ref reflex integration, balance, coordination, and movement, reading and math skills, and then literacy skills over the uh, five-year longitudinal analysis of the kids, finding that the kids that did the movement exercises as opposed to those without the intervention perform much higher on their um, college entrance uh, GCSE exams uh, than they would have been predicted to. Uh, and each area was statistical significance. That's so, amazing. Uh, and this was you know, done in a large group format. So these are classes of 30 to 60 kids watching a video in the movement program. You watch a video and you follow along. And you just do, you do the exercises along with the kids that are demonstrating the exercises. So super easy to do, um, really exciting outcomes. Yeah, it, it is always amazing. I think sometimes pe parents hear this for the first time and they, it, it's why it's so important to talk about why this isn't, why this helps because it seems so simple right. um, to get those outcomes. But uh, we do talk about a lot about primitive reflex, uh, primitive reflexes and, and their integration and um, needing to deal with that as one of the roots of um, why developmental um, development's gone offline with these kids or their immune system's gone offline or whatever it may be that's presenting with them. So uh, it is great to hear that there's a, what I would consider to be a simple, um, uh, something that's pretty easy to implement uh, either at home or in school uh, to, to help these kids move forward in that regard. Yeah, and you know, it was developed in school and then we adapted it to home and, and gave a structure to it. Um, so I think, you know, what's important is the research started in 2003. We released the program last year wow. in 2017. Um, it needed its time. Uh, we needed the evidence base there and the outcomes were so overwhelming. We had to take it from the classroom and bring it to parents at home. Yeah. So, so this is a program that parents can access directly um, yeah. online. That's fantastic. Yeah. So they go to um, 
movementprogram.com and they can sign up and start their child immediately. So it's just a subscription and they're following video-based exercises, um, but really important uh, on the compliance with this, within time, with the listening program. In order for brain plasticity and learning to occur, we have to do these programs with the right frequency, intensity, and duration. Okay, if we do too little, there won't be a change. And if we say, oh, if more is good, a lot more is great. Mm -hmm. Well, if you do too much, you also don't get change. You overload the system. So all of these programs are designed kind of with that precision that we know what's the just right amount of novelty and challenge to urge the brain to move forward and how do we build on that every day. What we do today is setting us up for what we're doing tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to be perfect, okay? We're gonna miss days and things are gonna happen, but overall, focus on the five days a week. Do the you know nine minutes if it's in time, 15 if it's TLP, 15 if it's movement program. Stick with it, follow the program as it's designed, and it's really straightforward. Do you have any parents that um, incorporate more than one of these programs at the same time, or do you encourage a succession of moving through them? Uh, that, that's a, a, a big question with no single answer. It's what's best for the child. Mm -hmm. So it depends where they are. So, you know, we train providers and help them with the rationale to understand when to do what. But here's an interesting thing that was found in the study on the movement program. The kids that did a cycle of the listening program, which would be typically a 10-week therapy. In the schools, it was 12 weeks because of breaks. The kids that did their listening program first, then did the 12 weeks of movement program, out of the five study groups, they performed the best. So listening first, then movement, were where the opposite actually didn't get the result. Hmm. Some people like to overlay and do things simultaneously. It depends on the individual. But again, it goes to the more is not always better. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, well, if movement's great, let's listen during the movement. For some, yes. For some, it's too much. Yeah. Um, but you know, we have a lot of kids. My son, uh, I, I use uh, Brendan a lot. He's eight. Uh, he goes to a Montessori school. And when he comes, I pick him up at three o'clock. I bring him to our office. So that's generation four. <laughs> when it comes here, the first thing he does is 30 minutes of listening with an activity he likes. Um, so he'll play with kinetic sand, he'll color, he'll do puzzles or other activities he really enjoys. That's our integration time to help him transition from school to being here with us. Mm -hmm. Then he has some other activities he'll do. Then he does his movement program. And we, we run them in parallel. And those are after school activities. And, you know, it ends up for him that's 45 minutes, 30 minutes of listening because he does two sessions and the movement program and it works beautifully. Yeah, no, well, and that's good to know. It, I, and with most of these things, it does need to be a personalized approach. It's the, what we typically recommend overall for everything. So it's good to know that it's really flexible in that, but also oh. very interesting to hear. And it'd be, I'm sure you're digging into why the group that had the listening uh, program first and then the movement program actually did better than, than the other groups overall. Be interested to hear what, where you go with that at some point in time. Yeah. Well, and you know, and another researcher in a similarly designed study found the same outcome. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's really interesting. Well, I think we've covered a whole heck of a lot today and I really appreciate all of your time because I think that, like I said, these are, these are great, um, non-invasive, uh, calming, you know, so in the case of the, the, uh, listening, uh, sorry, the therapeutic listening program that, uh, that parents can easily do with their kids. So it's always good to find interventions that uh, both help them and help retrain their brains, uh, to do what they were supposed to do in the first place. So thank you so much for sharing with us all the background and the science behind it, because, this is evidence-based therapy, and it's important for people to understand that. Thanks so much. And hopefully we'll do this all again <laughs> in the future. I hope so. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Tara.